earth in various ways, all right? And then what about this cycle? What about these things that are, these, these things that are called the signs, okay? Um, <coughs> the signs themselves have a pattern, which once you get an idea of it, you can start to get basic meanings. One of the patterns is beginning, middle, and end, okay? Okay, if you want to think of it as a curve, or maybe you want to think of it as the beginning, the start of something, the first initial energy, the middle where you're trying to hang on, and the end where you're letting go. The, of course, in astrology, there's a term for that. There's hundreds, as a matter of fact, there's some really good astrology dictionaries out there because there's so many terms for so many. It's cardinal, fixed, and mutable. So what happens with these? Well, the cardinal signs have a tendency to be pushing, to have the initial energy, to have a fairly pure form of it. The fixed signs are wanting to hang on, not change. And the mutable signs have a tendency to be changeable because they're about to get set and move into something else. All right? Yeah, I know this goes and reflects into some of Aristotle's ideas and things like that. Um, but pretty basic. And, you know, it's human experience, too. You know, you start off a race. You put all your energy into getting going. Then you're trying to hang on. And then towards the end, you're starting to peter out and <laughs> get to the point of changing. Okay, into the, the next phase, which is probably falling on the ground, if it was me. <laughs> so, that pattern is imbued in these signs, starting with Aries. Cardinal, fixed, mutable, and so on, all the way around. Cardinal, fixed, mutable, cardinal, fixed, mutable. And so, every one of those signs that has the same designation has a similarity in that sense. Okay? All the cardinal signs start things off. All the fixed signs are more rigid. The mutable ones have a certain amount of flexibility. All right? And then, so we have this threefold division, and we also have the elements. All right? We have earth, air, fire, and water. And once you combine those, you get, then get this 12-fold pattern. That's all that it is, okay? These two cycles are kind of combining and in such a wonderful way that you can get an idea. Which is which? Well, we have Aries here is fire, and I'm gonna use the old symbols, and if you don't know these symbols, I'll give you the quick mnemonic for them. These are the elemental symbols. Upward pointed triangle for fire, just like a bonfire. Here we have earth, the mnemonic for this, really cute. It's a downward pointing triangle, and if you see the line as being the horizon, it's pointing down into the earth. Okay, real simple. Over here we have air. Same thing, except it's pointing up into the air. Okay, and water. If you've ever been to one of those old fountains and seen one of those paper cups that are triangular, okay? <laughs> hey, it works, okay? Whatever works. Yeah, so. <laughs> I know, I know, but that was a really helpful to, for me as a mnemonic to remember these symbols, okay? So that pattern continues all the way through, and we have the standard attributes of those four elements. So let's take and bounce around just a little bit here. So it, let's look at Scorpio, okay? That's a fixed sign, and it's water, okay? Fixed. It doesn't want to change very much. It's water, but it has to do with things like the unconscious and death and that sort of thing. So what do you get when you have a lot of Scorpio? Okay, you've got something that doesn't want to move much. Okay, but also is very deep. And you will find that people with a lot of Scorpio in their chart. Notice I am not saying Scorpios because I'm avoiding sun sign language. Okay. Um, I'll tell you why sun signs are. Yeah, he said it. <laughs> um, but if you have a lot of Scorpio energy, you have a lot of ability to get into the depth, to look behind things, to see what's peeking behind. Because think of waters that are extremely still, 
in fact, maybe stagnant, <laughs> okay, with a lot of depth to them. Okay, sort of, and if you get that kind of Lovecraft feeling, that's probably appropriate in some ways to Scorpio, okay? <laughs> so, let's, look, let's pick on another sign. Uh, we have another fixed sign, which is uh, Leo, okay? Fixed fire, fire that wants to keep burning brightly, okay? Fire that's out there, fire that's extroverted, fire that is, oh, attention grabbing, okay? Um, fire that is like a great actor or actress who loves all that attention, okay? Fire that is extremely gregarious. So a lot of people with Leo in their chart, you know, critical stuff can be very out there and very great with gr groups of people. But each one of these also has their weakness. If you ignore a Leo, it just pisses them off terribly. <laughs> okay, it's one of the ways that you can really grab them. So that's fixed. Let's look at some of the cardinals, um, you know, like Aries. Cardinal fire, okay? When does that occur? March 21st, okay? The middle of spring, by the way, not the beginning of spring, okay? One of my bugaboos, everybody in the West seems to think that the seasons start at totally wrong time. Just look at Shakespeare, Midsummer Night's Dream is June 21st, not the beginning of summer. In any case, short rant. Um, <laughs> Aries, beginning fire, the very beginning for the, 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 the sense of that power that's needed to get spring really moving, okay? The first spark of something, the first point in any cycle, okay? And I really do want to emphasize that point. If you think of and watch anything as a cycle going through, you will find that there are ways to correlate the journey with the zodiac as a major archetype. And a lot of people speak of this as an archetypal journey of the soul. Just like you could maybe map it onto the 78 cards of the Tarot and things like that. Um, as a matter of fact, for those of you who are interested in literature, there is on the internet someone's dissertation and they show how Chaucer in the Canterbury Tales goes twice through the zodiac, okay? It's called um, Chaucer's Solar Pageant, I believe. And this person makes the argument that we do have Chaucer's little essay on the astrolabe, which is the first English writing we have on it, on a scientific instrument. It's very cool. And in the end he says, and I'll tell you more about how to use this for astrology, something like that. And this person argues that his Canterbury Tales are just tales meant to give the meanings of the zodiac signs. Which is really kind of neat. But yet another thing to look at and to think, wait a minute, all of this was imbued. And you know, Chaucer talked about the humors and all the rest, so it was obvious that he was knowledgeable. So, so those are the signs of the zodiac, you know, and we could go through all of them, but we don't have time for this, just, this, just being an introduction. All right, but you can start to get a sense of each of these from that, all right? Um, now, one of the critical things that you will find is that the planets are connected to the signs, okay? Most of Western astrology talks about rulership, okay? Not quite the word that I would use. Nowadays, the people who are more in the know and who are looking at the older traditions talk about what's called essential dignities. Okay, because a planet can be either in good shape, able to do what it needs to do, okay, or in bad shape in some sense. The planets can do one of three things, as my teacher Robert Zoller told me. A planet can make something happen, it can make something happen and destroy it, or it can prevent something from happening. And a lot of that depends on how good the planet is placed in the zodiac and in the cycle. And in order to determine that, the planets have different places that they are and different dignities within those. Now the one dignity almost all astrologers will talk about is rulership, okay, which really is called domicile. Home, what's the home place for the planet? Where, can, where are they like the king in the castle? And they can get stuff done because the king just says it and it happens. Well, uh, 
for a while, I, I was lost as to why certain things had certain rulerships. But after digging around for long enough, here's what I had figured out. We start with the sun and moon, and the moon being the easiest to see, <laughs> okay, since we can stare at it for a long time and not get our eyes burnt out. When is the moon in the strongest and best position? If the moon rules the night, okay, as I believe there's even a place in scripture, the sun rules the day, the moon rules the night. Um, if it rules the night, where is it going to be full and up for more hours of the night than any other position? I see people thinking, now it's going to be a full moon, right? That's its PowerPoint, okay? Opposite the sun, and when is the longest night of the year? Winter solstice. No, winter, solstice. Winter, solstice. winter solstice. So the sun would be in Capricorn, and the moon would be in Cancer. Okay? When the moon is full in Cancer, the sun will be going down at the earliest time of the year. The moon will be rising, and it will be up and full for more than 12, maybe 13, 14 hours. I forget how long nights are in the winter, and it depends on your latitude. And then it will set. It will be at its strongest point in Cancer. Okay? Cool. That makes sense. All right? Now, then we kind of have to work, well, wait, if that's the point, then where's the sun the strongest? And for that, we look to some of the seasons, and we know that, oh, yeah, the sun moves into Cancer, and that's midsummer, but you get that lag of the heat, and really August, you know, late July, or August is going to be the strongest, and that's where you get the sun ruling Leo, okay? strongest point in the climate. Remember, these things are connected in with hot, cold, wet, and dry, and all the rest. Now, from there, we then start to look at, guess what, that order again, okay? And we get Mercury ruling the two to each side. We get Mercury ruling Gemini and Virgo. Now, here's another little cycle. We have positive, negative, positive, negative, um, day, night, male, female, masculine, feminine, feminine, okay? And that cycle goes all the way through too. It's a two-fold cycle. So Mercury rules the positive air element, a day sign, and a night sign of a mutable Earth. Okay, so each of the other planets rules a day and a night sign. Okay, so if we go to Venus, night sign Taurus, day sign Libra, we go to Mars, night sign uh, Scorpio, day sign Aries, we go to Jupiter, the night sign is uh, uh, Pisces, the day sign is Sagittarius. And Saturn gets these two up here at the top, Capricorn for uh, night, and Aquarius for day. All right. Now you notice that I have not put in modern planets. <coughs> modern planets, to my mind, do not rule signs because they do not fall into this archetypal schema. The modern planets, when they were found, because the rationale behind this and because the idea of essential dignities and the whole tradition in the East, in, in the West rather, of hot, cold, wet, and dry and seasons and understanding all of that was lost. And people thought that the planets ruled a sign because they were like that sign. Okay? okay. No, it's because they have the most power in that sign because they're efficacious. There are some similarities, okay? but it fits into this schema. What they started doing was they put Uranus here, okay, or yeah, Uranus here, Neptune here, and there was a considerable fight when Pluto came in. A lot of people put Pluto at Aries, okay? But they finally decided, at least some of them, to put it into Scorpio, 
okay? But these planets are not visible. They don't fit into that schema. Now, there is another kind of rulership, and that is what are the things that are attributed to the correspondences. And Neptune has been shown to have cycles with the oil, supply and demand, you know, Pluto volcanoes, Uranus was right on the midheaven when uh, the Hiroshima bomb went off, things like that. So as we look at events and their correlations, we start to see those. But for ruling signs and being stronger or weaker in a sign, I don't think so, not for the modern planets, okay? Uh, you will be led somewhat astray. So this means that each planet has a positive and a negative. So it, let's take one of my favorite examples. Mars in Aries will start a fight. Mars and Scorpio will damn well end it. <laughs> okay? If they're attacked, they will, you know, because the fixity, the intensity, the depth, okay, they will stay with it till the end. You know, okay? Mars might in, in Aries may poop out. Okay? Um, now so it just each one of these has these positive negatives, so that can also help you to get an idea of, oh, is this planet in one of its rulerships? If so, it's going to do really well. Well, what about the other way? If Mars is over here on the other side of the zodiac in Libra, sorry folks, it's screwed. <laughs> okay? It's not where it wants to be. It's in the opposite side. So any of these planets that are in the opposite sign are going to be weakened because they're not of that nature. They're going to have a much harder time and that's where you're going to get a planet that will either make something happen but then destroy it or prevent it altogether. Okay? So, once weakened, once softened. Okay? Or made in a detriment. You know? Now, I won't go into all the other essential dignities. There are, in fact, four more. Okay? One you will still hear in the in the West um, that's called um, oh, let's see now rulership um, exaltation okay and exaltation seems to be maybe an older system okay um, that existed and perhaps and there's a guy on the south side of Chicago who came up with an idea of what exaltation may be about based on when the sun is setting and how visible the planets are going to be at different points. But basically what happens there is when a planet is in its exalted sign, it's kind of like the king isn't in his castle, but he's at a birthday party somebody else is throwing. So nobody wants to piss him off either. Okay? You're being celebrated. Sometimes a planet that's in its exaltation can be a little bit out of the way. It can be like partying too much. Okay? Um, there's also triplicity, where a planet is in one of three signs that um, gives it some ability to do its uh, work. It, in fact, it's kind of lucky when it's in triplicity. Then there's another um, uh, pattern that's called bounds or terms, and that takes each sign and divides it up into five, but the five divisions are uneven for the five planets that aren't the sun or the moon. And if a planet is there, it's considered that it can do its work. And then you have face, which is a threefold division <laughs> of the zodiac. And if a planet is in a face, it can manage something sort of, but it's like it's like the day before your rent is due and you don't have it. <laughs> okay. So in fact, a planet that only has face dignity can sometimes be a bit on the nervous side. And Lee Lehman actually did a really nice study about this. Uh, showing how face dignity, in fact, almost isn't a dignity because the, the planet gets so nervous that it's about to run out, okay? In any case, so those are where these two things combine. You can get an idea of how they fit together, all right? Um, let me make sure that I'm keeping somewhere in here. Okay, houses. I'm going to give you a very brief... Now, the nice thing about houses is, once you get six of them, you can start to get the mnemonics and derive all the rest of the means. And I'll show you how to do that. All right? Can this flip, or no? I'll just... Can I... Hmm? If it's on wheels, you can spin it. Ah, spin it. Okay. You need to take a picture? Go for it. Thank you so much. All right. And, yeah. 
That way I won't spend time on So very quickly, we have the horizon in most house systems, okay? And if you want to start a fight at an astrology conference, ask them which house th system they use, and then tell them, oh, that's crap. <laughs> okay? Because there are at least a dozen ways of dividing up for the houses. But I'm going to talk in generalities here, okay? So here's the horizon, okay? Here's east. Now, the reason why these things are backwards from how we look at maps is because when you were in ancient Chaldea or whatever, and you were trying to make a map of the heavens, you'd be facing south because all the planets are going to be south. Okay? So you draw a piece of paper, you go, okay, south. Okay? The sun up here is at the top. Okay? And over here, things are rising, so this is the east. And over here on the piece of paper, oh, they're about to go down west, and that leaves us north for anything below the ground. Okay? Just, it, it does make sense when you think about it. Okay? So a planet that's about to come up is in the first house. The next is in the second. And then the third one that comes up, it's here. So look, you know, it's just the numbering does make sense if you think about it with that rotation. By the way, the rotation is called primary motion, okay? That sphere of the, of the, that carries the planets and all the rest along is called the primary motion. And in some methods of prediction, the old, one of the oldest ones, that, in fact, Ptolemy and people have resurrected lately, it's called primary progression, okay? In any case, so 10th, 11th, and 12th, okay? Now, really quickly, the first house is you. You yourself. The house of the person themselves. This also means their constitution, you know, your general health, things like that. Okay, pretty easy. Second, the house of things you own your possessions, okay? Why? Because right next to you is the stuff you own, all right? Third is, well, you've got to not sit in one place, so you're going to go on short journeys. What's the neighborhood? And also, people that are close to you, brothers and sisters, okay? But that's a little derivative. The fourth is the property that you're on, okay? and your inheritance, okay? So also the house of father. Modern astrology has this mixed up. They say the mother is there because they make the mistake of correlating this with the sign of cancer. But the father is here, and this is land and immovable wealth. The fifth is Oh, let's see now. Um, Short-term fun is one way of looking at it. This is the arts. This is um, performance. This is the stage, theater. Uh, this is gambling. Um, this is also children. And if you're not having fun at sex, you're doing it wrong. So this is the house of sexuality. You will see modern astrologers place this in the eighth. They are wrong. Okay, that didn't that attribution didn't start until the 20th century. Sixth house is the house of slaves. Huh? Well, things that you have that make some sense that, that are things that are useful. In modern psychological astrology, it's your abilities. Okay, but it's also other things that may be of some use, like animals, okay? And these are animals smaller than a uh, sheep or smaller. When you become a professional astrologer in certain places, they give you a, a sample sheep. So, I'm just kidding. All right, okay. so slaves, sheep, thing, or smaller. This is also illness. 
Okay. You know, it's a little bit of everything there. A traditional name was House of Slaves. Now, remember I said uh, we have this interesting kind of correlation. Remember that a planet in one sign, the opposite. So there's an opposite kind of thing going on with the houses, too. So if this is, and, and you can derive these others from this, and then I'll show you a really cool trick. If this is self, what is this? Others, not self, or partners. Partners could be a partner in a game, like an enemy, your sports opponent. It could be a spouse. It could be an open enemy, somebody who's suing you, okay? But it is others, the other person in general. In, uh, in geomantic divination, when we're doing the house uh, system, uh, this becomes any generic other person, okay? Now, if this is what you own, hey, how about this is what the other pre person owns, okay? So other's property is one meaning, okay? Now, the most common, though, is this is something that you don't hold. It's something that you can't grasp. And if you take that metaphor to further out, you get to meanings like death and the occult, things that are mysterious, that are wholly ungrabbable, okay? It's the, that place that you go where you're just unsure of, and so occult matters, hidden matters, things like that. Short journeys, long journeys. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. In the Middle Ages, in ancient times even, if you went on a long journey, what were you doing? Pilgrimage. It was a pilgrimage. So this is the religion of the masses, okay? This is also, oh gee, I've got to go to court. That's 60 miles away to see the magistrate, <laughs> okay? It's a long journey. It's also learning and connection to the masses, because another reason for pilgrimage was to go and learn something, such as what Pythagoras did. Wander around places and go and meet all the wise people, hang out in Alexandria, whatever. So long journeys is connected in with the courts, with universities, with pilgrimage, and the spirituality of the majority. Which, by the way, then gives you an idea of the spirituality of the minority is third house. Okay? It's another way of looking at it. Okay?